Well, tonight I'm talking about the historic roof coverings. And here you can see sort of typical uh, Roman stuff from an excavation. Uh, fairly heavy. Um, this is the sort of base tile. I haven't got one of the curved ones that sits over the top. Um, but that gives you an idea. Very soft fired. Uh, probably fired to only about 850, 900 degrees centigrade. So, you know, only just sort of a ceramic material. Uh, the hand making of the, the tiles were made, as I mentioned, in a mould. And here you can see uh, a typical mould for a, one of these small format tiles. You simply threw the clay in, swiped off the excess, and then turned it over onto a loose board and punched all holes through with um, a sharpened stick. And you can see the shape of the, um, the, the sort of holes there. Then to um, hang them on the roof, um, you used um, these tile pegs and uh, they weren't a tight fit, otherwise if they got wet in the rain they would swell and they would split the tile. So they're a slack fit and they just sort of poked through slightly because of course you've got another tile on top so they couldn't go very far through and they're just sitting there on their own weight and one peg per tile uh, was sufficient um, to, to sit them on the roof. And as long as you got another tile alongside it, it didn't go that way. So that's the way that they were hung. Medieval tiles, you can see they're bigger than our modern tile. There's a modern tile alongside it and you can see that it's longer and wider. And uh, this particular one is a nib tile. They've just stuck little bits of clay on and uh, it rested on those nibs on the, uh, the battens, the ribbon battens on the roof. And we've got a peg tile here uh, from the same excavation at Romsey Abbey in the cloisters. And again, you can see you've got peg holes, but this one's full of mortar. So they only used one and um, each course of tiles as they came up the roof they just put a little bit of lime mortar there as, as a bedding, as a wind pinning for the next tile. So you didn't get the wind up underneath and you didn't get water, rain sort of blowing back up underneath the tiles. So you can see the difference in uh, size there. Um, well there was no standardised size. These were on the same roof from the same period um, historically and you can see there's even a difference there. But by the time we get to um, the, uh, the 15th century, they're standardising the size. And there we've got um, a historic tile from the, the 16th century. And behind it, we've got a modern machine-made tile to the equivalent metric size. And you can see there, virtually the same size. So the size of the tile hasn't altered since um, that statute uh, which fixed the size of the tile, except um, for some areas like Kent where they produced a smaller peg tile, and this is a modern one, um, and they've stuck with that smaller size. Um, and it's particularly useful, this smaller size, for things like the oast houses where you've got a curved surface. A smaller tile you can get round the curve a lot better than a larger format tile. Right, well, the Kima tiles, um, handmade, and you took it out of the mould using your hand, cup it as a suction cup, and we'll pass this one round and you can try your hand for size in the, the mark on the back. Um, typical um, hand finished tile here. Uh, this one, you can see the way that the, the clay was uh, slotted into the mould and then sort of struck off. And um, Again, you've got quite a nice sort of camber to it, so that's quite a well-made uh, tile, which I'll pass around. What's coming into the country now um, are these tiles, 
Uh, this is the developer range coming in from Poland. Um, again, they're um, a machine made and hand finished tile. Got quite a nice sanded surface to them and they're much more reasonable than the fully handmade tile. And they don't look too bad on the roof. They've got a little bit of shape and character to them. So these are around about the sort of 600 pounds a thousand as compared with the, um, uh, the, the, the Kima tiles at about 1100 pounds a thousand. So it's, you know, it's, it's better than putting a concrete on, um, but at the same time, it's not quite the same as, as a nice handmade tile. And then at the bottom end of the price range, uh, you've got these um, tiles coming in from France and Belgium. And you can see here the anti-capillary groove, anti groove so that uh, you don't get water seeping up between and frosting problems. So I'll just pass those two round. What's the fraction of overlap usually with tiles of standard size? You, you put them... Yeah, you, you put them on at four inch gauge. So your battens are set out at four inch from top of batten to top of next batten going up the roof. And this gives you your overlap. So it's four inches and these are ten and a bit long, basically. And this is the uh, Victoria tile that was made just up the road outside the village here in the 19th century. You can see the way, it's a very flat machine made tile and you've had the problem with the capillary action. Um, Panta, oh yes, the, the modern French tile, single lap tile, and again you can see how they've worked in quite a complicated system of grooves here so that you don't get capillary action and they fit quite tightly and snugly on, on a roof. The traditional pan tile, you can see it's got a single nib on the back and they just lapped. You can see there's only that amount of overlap um, on the tile. And the, the next one sort of just overlaps there. And there's only um, a little bit of, of lap as you go down the roof as well. Yeah, need fewer of them. And again, uh, this is uh, a Dutch one. Um, you can see the um, anti-capillary grooves and the way that they slot it together uh, on the roof. And so these were coming in uh, between the two walls uh, into the country. The ridge tile, you extruded a continuous strip of clay, which was that shape with a, a flat peak on. Um, you sliced it with a wire cut to length and then uh, the hand finishing bit was you slotted onto it uh, one of these um, formers and you could then go around with a knife and you could cut the shape. Okay, so that's the way they were made. Um, patent interlocking tiles, this is the um, London architectural tile and again these slot it together and you just have that ridge which overlaps the upstand on the next tile alongside it. So um, that's the way that it was sort of weather tight uh, on, on the roof. Um, it's a bit delicate but I will pass it round for you to have a look at. Uh, finally, not a roof tile at all but a wall tile um, you've got these mathematical tiles which were look alike bricks and they were um, fixed to the wall, nailed to the wall um, and quite often bedded in a lime mortar so that they looked like brickwork. So there's a, an 18th century example and that's sort of a, a modern uh, uh, copy. Okay, so happy with the, the tile side of things now. Okay, so um, medieval Devonian slates then, um, they're quite thick and they've got a single peg hole and these are some of the small ones that survived. This was from um, excavations in uh, Southampton and also bits from Romsey. We know that the 
some of the uh, medieval roofs in Romsey had these uh, Devonian slate. So I'll pass, pass one around for you. Um, <coughs> the facsimile ones we had made for French Street in Southampton, that restoration job, again, various sizes, which we'll pass around for you to have a look at, single holes. And again, you'll see the edges are dressed so that you don't get capillary action uh, be between the um, capillary action between the slates. <laughs> the best quality North Welsh Penryn slate. Um, see the um, really good solid slate, quite hefty uh, for you to have a look at. And you can see the way that it's riven um, where the riving knife's gone in here, and you can see the way that it's run with the grain of the slate. And uh, in fact, he could have probably got two slates out of this. If you look at the edge, you can see again where it's begun to, uh, to split through. Okay, it comes with a health and safety warning, it's heavy. Um, this is a typical prime quality uh, Spanish slate, and again, Rings beautifully, quite, quite a good, well-finished slate, nicely trimmed edges. You'll see there are no um, nail holes in it. Um, the, traditionally, the slater um, holds the, uh, the slate on the roof according to the gauge of the battens that he's uh, using uh, on the roof. And he holds it from the back with, um, basically, it's, it's a hammer with a spike on. And... He taps at the, back, at the back here, so he gets a nice clean hole at the back. Uh, but at the front, as it breaks through, it spelches out the slate and gives you actually um, a, a little bit of a countersink. So that when you nail the slate on the roof with a copper nail, uh, the nail head sits in that bit of a countersink and so your slates fit tight on the roof. The other thing a good slater will do when he gets his delivery of slate, he'll go through it, spend a few hours actually thicknessing the slate to make sure that each course of slate that he has on the roof is the same thickness. Because you don't want a thick one next to a thin one, otherwise the next course will kick um, as you come across the, the roof. So there's your, your prime uh, Spanish one. Can it be mechanically ruined? Nobody's really been very successful at mechanical riving. You can't beat the eye looking to see where it's the natural splitting plane. Um, this is um, one uh, dating between the wars from the uh, south of France, and you can see a um, lot of iron pyrites in it, and it's actually holed right through where the pyrites have dissolved, and also it's delaminated. So fairly fragile, I'll pass that one round. Uh, this imported slate, as you can see, the only way they made it weathertight was to use that um, horrible black goo on it, the turnerizing system. And again, it's ruined the slate, you can't reuse it anyway, um, now that it's, it's had that uh, system on it. Okay. North American slate, um, good quality, but quite expensive these days. Um, this is rather a nice sort of greenish tinge to it. Will go very well with the uh, the Westmoreland uh, slates. Right, this is a Camborne slate. Anybody know where Camborne is? Cornwall, yeah, okay, well that's what it's called, it comes from Brazil, <laughs> so again you have to be very, very careful, you know, think Camborne slate, oh that's, that's alright, you know, it's made in Britain sort of thing, um, but it's one of these um, South American slates, high percentage of calcites in it, so uh, it's going to fade. It's actually brought, to be fair, it's brought in large blocks into this country and it's split in Cornwall. Hence the Camborne 
name. Okay, this one is called an Eastmoreland slate. Anybody know of Eastmoreland? China, that's right. <laughs> yeah, www.chinaslatecompany, UK. <laughs> yeah, so again, be very, very cautious when you see names that look, you know, to give it credibility. Um, again, it's one of these, and you can actually see, you know, the way it's beginning to sort of break down already, and it's not actually even been out in the rain. And uh, again, this is another one from China. This is their River Grey, you know, to go well with the sort of Welsh. And the, the new kid on the block is um, this one. Um, this is from India. Don't know how it's going to perform. It's not been in this country long enough on roofs for us to know. Um, it's not a metamorphic slate. It's actually a stone. Um, so it's more akin to sort of Cotswold material than it is to the metamorphic slates from, um, from, from Wales. Um, but we do know that the, you know, the paving that's coming in from India, quite a lot of it's pretty good quality and seems to, you know, stand up quite well. So, you know, the jury's out on this one. Uh, the only th other thing I was going to mention um, is the rainwater goods, um, traditionally cast iron. And I'll hand round um, cast iron piece and the spun aluminium, which is better than plastic, but when you hand the two around, you'll see the difference in quality, weight, etc., of the two items. Um, cast will last. It needs looking after, occasionally painting, although it's now coming in a, a, a special coating, uh, which shouldn't need redoing too often. Um, the gutters, the same. Uh, we've got a piece of cast iron guttering and the piece of uh, cast aluminium guttering, which is better than the extruded material, uh, but still not quite man uh, enough. The problem with aluminium, and here we've got a, a heavier cast uh, aluminium section, um, the problem with aluminium is um, it's fine while ever you've got the protective coating on it, but if you're in a seaside area or within 10 miles of the coast, um, you can get corrosion due to uh, chlorides in the air, etc., and it will break down quite quickly. So, um, you know, cast iron, particularly if you've got a listed building, is the thing to go for. Conservation officer might accept cast aluminium as a, a, an alternative, but uh, certainly not plastic, which will break down with sunlight over a 20-year period, um, and the extruded aluminium is fine until you lean a ladder against it. Okay, um, I won't pass this round because it's lead and health and safety and all that jazz, uh, but you can see there the effect of toxic runoff, uh, sorry, the uh, acidic runoff. You know, you can see right through that sheet of lead, and that's 30 years of just runoff from lichens and mosses. Okay, you're allowed to go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.